from Milan, Italy. He was uh, past president of European Society of Shoulder and Elbow, and he is the director of international research of Shoulder and Elbow in Milan. And he was uh, uh, he is a full professor of orthopedic uh, uh, department in uh, Milan University, chief of Shoulder Unit Humanitarian Research Hospital in Milan, Italy. Thank you for your coming and uh, thank you for that you are covering the second lecture also. So you will proceed for the first lecture, Influence of screw type and Lens on Fixation of Anterior Bone Graft for Shoulder Instability. Okay, thank you very much for this beautiful introduction and thank you for the invitation. I feel very honored and delighted to be here to represent the Italian community. You know what is happening in Italy now, but not only there. But anyways, I was brave enough to come over and say hello to my friends here. And I hope it is written properly. Yeah? Yeah, I wish everyone to have the best meeting ever. So uh, I have a topic. This is my disclosure, nothing to do with this. It is the influence of the screw type and length of fix fixation of anterior bone grafts. I'm sorry we have very few people because sometimes we are following just the technique and we do not understand that some details may change the outcome very much. However, we will spend a few minutes about it. First of all, some history about this bone grafting because there is a confusion about the evolution of it. And you know that the story of bone grafting for instability is starting with Rudolf Theis Hedden in 1918 when he described this bone grafting anteriorly, but please note, it was not with a screw. It was just grafting a sort of J-graft that was even then described by Samuel Ibinet, and you see that it is very similar here to some J-graft, not exactly the screw that we are used to think of when we speak about the Eden Ibinet technique. Then, finally, Michel Latarget came with this technique, and you know the history of the, the Latarget technique. Do you know it? Well, uh, Trilla that you see on top, because otherwise, uh, if, if you don't know the story, the history, you will never understand what is happening today if you don't know what happened yesterday or what will happen tomorrow. So Trilla was describing taking down the coracoid, 50%, you know the technique, and Michel Latarget went to visit him, and he tried to do the same going home. And he, he broke the coracoid. They say, now what I do? And he fixed it with two screws. This is the startup of the Latarget technique. This is true history. Gilles Vach told me this. So he described this technique. And a few years later, Elfet, a South African guy, described this repair that he dedicated to Walter Raleigh Bristol. But the describer was Elfet. But again, it is not the, health, uh, the Bristol letter, excuse me, the Bristol technique that you know, because it was just a little cleft in the subscap where you were reattaching the subscap. It was not the way we describe it now. So this was the origin. Only in 1970, May added a screw uh, mimicking what was the, the Latarget technique. This is the true history. Finally, the present Latarget bone block technique that was already mentioned today was described by 1978 by uh, uh, Didier Pat with this anterior triple locking, coracoid glenoid augment, capsule, suture, and inferior subscap sling. This is what we do now. So now, after this itinerary of bone grafting for instability, let's start the race for results. Starting with the complication. This is coming from Northern America. And it is a major complication of the modified Bristol procedure for recurrent dislocation of the shoulder with this loosening pseudoaneurysm, brachial plexus compression. So quite a severe one, and it was 1972. Then uh, uh, some results of the treatment with adenibinet, so bone grafting again. They had these 20 failures, let's say, out of 120, so it means around 15% of failure with this technique. So where is the failure of the system? Why we have this problem? Let's start uh, analyzing this. The complication, this is Joe, uh, Joe Zuckerman, uh, 1984, described the, this complication with 13 reoperation, erosion of the axillary artery, brachial plexus, paresthesia, 
uh, and the concerns were the cartilage damage uh, and, and a higher cost of the revision of the revision procedure. Is it only the screw is my question and it is the question of this presentation. Let's go to that. Uh, again, this is uh, Ovilius, one of the major uh, experts in this kind of technique, and he was reporting in 1983 a 6% reoperated by screw problems because of the length, malpositioning, and loosening. So, length, malpositioning, loosening. The three key points when you use some metal in any joint. So, question that we ask ourselves, am I doing it right? Or it is the right thing to do? Let's start with some basic science. And this is a study reporting and comparing a cannulated screw, 4 millimeter, compared to a 3.5. And you see the cycles of failure and the just the strength that are needed to, to bring to a failure. And you understand that a full threaded and a full a screw is performing much better, significantly better. So first message, maybe cannulated are not performing the same. Then how we do place our, our, uh, our screws is also important because if you go for monocortical, you may have a failure of your system that is almost 50% of a bicortical fixation. However, it is exposing us to another risk, that is the nerve risk, because the nerve of the, the suprascapular nerve is very close here. And you see in this presentation, in this uh, cadaveric specimen here, this is the spinoglenoid notch, the major branch of the nerve. The superior screw is here, the inferior screw is here, and we have then the minor branches out there. So if you are too long, you may eventually irritate your, uh, your nerve. So the angle is also important to prevent, to prevent some problems like this. And I had a few cases that I treated removing those. This is the last, largest review and the review papers were mentioned earlier this morning. They are very important to understand things. And these are the complications reported by Michael Grisser. And he described the, the removal of the hardware in a quite significant amount of cases, 46 in the entire series. And lysis of the coracoid was also common, 3.2%, and non-union was almost 10%. So we have an issue with the process of healing. Then, comparing different kinds of screws, bicortical metal are for performing much better than absorbable interference screw that we try to use uh, in order to reduce the invasion of it. Then how do we place our bone graft? We can place it in a, a classic system, like I personally do, but for a certain period now, it is almost gone, there was the so-called congruent uh, J. It was just putting uh, 90 degrees rotated, and this is the way, theoretically better because of the shape that is the same shape of the glenoid. And so you may have less friction with the humor head. However, the strength and the resorption in this congruent arc latergé is performing poorer than the classic one. This is a comparison of different screws. This study in arthroscopy 2017, uh, partial threaded, solid, 4 millimeters, fully threaded, 3.4, partially threaded, blah, 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 blah. And what the authors reported, there are no major differences in the um, fixation of the graft itself. And this is my study that I did uh, as a biomechanical study using three different possible configuration. I used a partially threaded anchor, uh, excuse me, screw, a 3.5, 3.5 fully threaded, and all a uh, completely metallic anchor with no, not traded, solid one. Uh, and I compared the displacement that is in the vertical bar and the load that is needed for that. And you can easily understand that if you go bicortical, bicortical, everything is performing well. If you go with one screw, unicortical and bicortical, you clearly understand that the solid screw it, and, and this fully traded screw are performing better. Finally, if you go unicortical, unicortical, you see again here that the fully, uh, the, the solid screw and the fully traded are performing better, while the non-fully traded and 
and sorry and yes and cannulated are performing poorly so choosing the proper screw is playing a role in the solid repair that you do so the design here this is another study in arthroscopy very recent that I checked in the literature just before leaving to come here they were comparing this possible augmentation like top hat or wedged profile plates and eventually biomechanically spe uh, speaking this may help then the next step so the screw may affect the way we place it and the, cho uh, the choice that we make for it then understanding the bone healing is also important and from the medical school we should remember the cutting cones cutting cones are basic to, to achieve a stability and film contact to the bone to bone is helping to create these cones that are leading to the healing of the bone so if you don't have a good compression you may, may not be very happy then also the graft must be osteoconductive with some structural stability so we, we need some cortical bone there osteoinductive osteogenic with some live cells and vascularized so what is happening to the, our bone graft whatever we do let's go to the fate of the graft this is an Italian guy Giovanni Di Giacomo which is reporting here with this study that you may have less osteolysis in patient that have a major bone deficiency in the glenoid above 15 percent and this is the graft union assessment by computer tomography in primary and revision later J and basically these authors are reporting that there are no major differences whatever they do either primary or revision and this is young Ri, Ri from Korea that says something very interesting to me the fate of the graft uh, if you take your MRI or CT scan sorry the CT scan here immediately after surgery and after a couple of years you will notice this this is not really a resorption in a negative way it is because you have a remodeling of the bone where the bone is loaded or under some load this will a way preserve its shape otherwise it will resorb like all the times the bone does so you you need to understand these two so what are we aiming in summary screw must soundly fix the graft promoting the healing the type design is influencing the fixation strength and I think that you got some information in this short presentation length short might worsen stability however long orientation the length and the orientation might arm the anatomical structures so you must always have these principles in mind when you do this kind of surgery because knowing the basic science optimizing the fixation is avoiding hardware complications thank you very much again and enjoy your meeting very much the, the second uh, talk by professor Peter Tonino from States he is a professor of orthopedic surgery and a sport medicine program and also he is a chairman of the International Committee and directors of ANA uh, his talk will be about the lethargy versus arthroscopic liberal surgery Please, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I kind of want to defend the American uh, orthopedic surgeon <laughs> because we do not perform a lot of, a lot of letter J surgery. So it's a little bit of an arm wrestle, my disclosures. So my experience with shoulder instability, I'm pretty old. Uh, I started um, my orthopedic residency in 1981. So I did uh, what we talked about. Uh, Alex just talked about open treatment of shoulder instability with a Bristol procedure. So I'm not afraid of open shoulder surgery. And then in 1986, 1987, I worked with Dr. Job in California, and we started operating by diagnostic arthroscopy, but then open shoulder stabilization. Then uh, since 1987, I've been at Loyola University in Chicago. So at the beginning, I was continuing the quick arthroscopy, then the open bank art. But then with time, I transitioned to arthroscopic treatment of shoulder instability, which is what I do now. 
So why did I change? Because it's always described the bank card, open bank card was the gold standard of shoulder stabilization, at least in the United States. Well, people don't like big incisions. Um, with the deltoid uh, uh, pectoral approach, you have to maybe, you can possibly damage the deltoid a little bit when you spread the deltoid and the conjoint tendon, when you pull it off to the side, can cause perhaps some injury to the musculocutaneous nerve or direct injury to the nerve. The subscapularis, you need to either release it, which can then tear if it doesn't heal after surgery. With Dr. Job, we split the subscapularis, so less detachment, uh, but some injury to the subscapularis when you manipulated the subscapularis and separated the muscle. And this was shown by Marcus Schleibel, Schleibel and uh, Peter Habermeyer about damage to the subscapularis that can occur just by manipulating whether you split it or partially detach it during open surgery. Um, and with open surgery, first, when we first started, we didn't even care about the labrum. We just do capsular surgery, forget about the labrum. But then we understood the importance of the labrum, so we started repairing the labrum with uh, suture anchors, to, you know, the little uh, holes in the glenoid. Many of you that are older maybe will remember those. The Fukuda retractor to hold the joint open. Um, and the biggest problem with labrum surgery, especially uh, for us with some of these athletes, is they are very big. So it's very, <laughs> very difficult to do the surgery on a big athlete like this with open surgery. And then the capsule, how much do you, sh we talked about it before, how much do you shift? Do you shift a little bit? Do you vertical? How much? Do you overlap a little bit? A lot? Very difficult. What position? Like this? Like that? So one of the reasons I changed, I thought that I could better uh, visualize and see better with, the, with arthroscopic surgery. I thought it was more precise. We talked about, you know, understanding the anatomy. So uh, there are some lesions that you don't see with open surgery. You cannot see the posterior superior labral tear, a partial cuff tear, a hill sac lesion. You don't see that very well. A bony bancart lesion, maybe, maybe not. And you can't really assess capsular laxity open as much as you can arthroscopically. You can't see the bands of the inferior glenohumeral ligament very well from the outside. And for me, one of the big game changers, I think, was when, uh, and many years ago at, uh, at the academy, when Mike Tech came out with this little metal anchor. So that was a big decision to transition from um, from doing standard arthroscopic surgery, uh, standard open surgery to arthroscopic stabilization because this little anchor allowed you to perform uh, a stabilization surgery without drilling holes in the glenoid. And then the suture passing devices came out to allow us to placate the capsule, fix the labrum repair. So they were another thing that helped me change to arthroscopic stabilization. So what I worry about the Latergé is that many surgeons who perform a Latergé never perform an arthroscopy before the Latergé. So I think maybe the Latergé surgeons don't care about the capsule and the labrum. They don't care about evaluating and repairing the Bancard lesion, and they can't assess capsular laxity, they can't placate, they can't tension the, cap the capsule. The latter J surgeons, they answer, I do feel very bad about the labrum and the capsule, but don't you care about bone loss? So the frequency of bone loss after shoulder dislocation, multiple studies, most of them don't have, with simple dislocations, that much of a bone loss. The number of people who have major bone loss from a simple dislocation is not that often, but with recurrent instability, definitely you can see more bone loss patients. But for simple shoulder instability episodes, dislocations, not as much bone loss as you would anticipate. How we measure bone loss, I don't think we know exactly. This is another paper recently. Everybody has a different way of measuring bone loss, so that means that maybe we don't have one good method. And uh, critical bone loss is shrinking. This is from this morning where you look at 20%, 15 to 20%, more than 15%. So. Our, our decision for bone loss, it's becoming smaller and smaller. And we know from uh, Dr. Castagna just said, if you do bony procedures when they don't have much bone loss, more chance that, that uh, uh, the bone will uh, atrophy or, or uh, not heal. 
Um, sometimes uh, there's good news though with arthroscopic surgery that we can find the bone loss with an arthroscopic procedure because we can find the bone fragment that's contributing to the bone loss. And if you look um, in somebody like this, for example, uh, you have to look for the bone loss. You can see the fragment if you get a CT scan, and I think if you're looking for bone loss, you're probably getting a digital uh, CT scan to look for the fragment, see if the fragment, and then you can mobilize it. Even if it's displaced medially on the glenoid neck, you can mobilize it, bring it up, and repair so you can restore the anatomy of the glenoid. So you can bring the, the bony fragment back up, and no need for La Targeuse. I think uh, several studies have shown that there is danger with the Latarge. Uh, if you do neuromonitoring of the axillary musculitaneous nerve, like uh, Dr. Castagna just talked about, is not infrequent if you do assessment of what's happening with the nerve during surgery. Uh, and many studies have shown a 30% complication rate, 7% additional surgery rate with Latarge. Uh, I see somebody in the front row this, uh, this uh, morning asked about, what about the bone loss? Okay, the bone can disappear, and that happens when you transfer the bone. Sometimes you lose the blood supply to the bone, and the bone can disappear, or lice, uh, you can get lysis or non-union of the coracoid process after lethargy. We know that it can be a problem. But wait, there's more. <laughs> um, we know about arthroscopic lethargy, very and we talked about it this morning, very difficult procedure, technically procedure with high complication rate in people who don't do a lot of it. So that's been demonstrated. And Dr. Gerber published this study in, uh, in Dr. Ryder's journal here um, that Latergé in patients over 40 provides good stability but advanced but clinically mild symptomatic dislocation arthropathy. A recent study, again, in the Journal of Sports Medicine in 2019, that bone block stabilizations procedure uh, are associated with a tenfold increase in complication compared to soft tissue procedures. So what is the take-home message? I do think that in the proper hands, LATRJ is one of the options available today to restore glenoid bone loss due to anterior shoulder dislocations. And if you, go in, if you are in France, high chance you will get a LATRJ procedure if you dislocate your shoulder. But there are problems with the Latarge. It is non-anatomic, does not allow for assessment and treatment of intraarticular shoulder stability lesions, instability lesions. And it has a higher complication rate than arthroscopic label stabilization surgery for most simple shoulder stability cases. I do think it is a good option in the setting of recurrent shoulder instability and failed arthroscopic stabilization surgery where glenoid bone loss is more likely. Shukran. Now we go back for Italy, and Dr. Castagna is representative of the Italian society to us, and he will talk about shoulder instability, arthroscopic revision surgery. Yes, thank you. I wait for my presentation. I, I prepared this on the flight because I, I understood that nobody was here from Italy but me. So I worked on this, but I had a couple of papers that I published on this topic, so we can open some thinking windows in our brain. So, thank you. Okay, again, this is not very much. The role of arthroscopy. Sorry, to go back. First of all, we need to understand one thing, that very few people, we were discussing about instability today, that the shoulder is unstable. I mean, this location is not a disease in my mind, it's simply an event of the life because of the biomechanics of the shoulder. The miracle is that it is not dislocating all the time. And when we speak about this kind of instability, there are hundreds of different scenarios that we need to face. So we cannot speak only about instability, but we should go much deeper into it. Anyways, we go to the literature. This is open surgery, you read on top on the right. Uh, average is 7.3%. Then we go to the, uh, to the arthroscopic repair. It is higher, but it is very much higher if you have younger population. And, you know, we were discussing earlier this morning, not only because of the lifestyle, not only for many other reasons, but also for the biological condition of the capsule that is changing its structure 
during the evolution of the people. So younger means loser. So revision is requested in case of complication. The most common complication is instability and you know, of instability is recurrence. So when we need to face it upside down, we need to go back what is wrong in that shoulder and why it failed. Just the reverse. And this is a crazy algorithm that I found in the literature about the revision of recurrent instability. And I'm not going into it, otherwise we can spend the entire day. But you understand how much complicated can be the topic. Because it is very much related if we have some bone defect, capsular defect, neurological defect, and many other things. And you may have one or more of one of these conditions all together. So again, it's tough to speak the same language. Anyways, when we speak about this glenohumeral instability revision, we think about failure. But other, other speakers earlier this morning were saying that failure is not only recurrence, because failure can be a symptomatic subluxation. This is a failure because the patient is asking us not to have any pain, any symptom in the shoulder, or is a limited range of motion. I am an old man, so I remember the putty plat procedure. Uh, when I was a young student, we were treating instability with stiffness. That is not treating instability. So again, these are failures to me, at least, not only recurrence. And what to do when you have a recurrence? First of all, you need to understand the problem. Remember the graphic that I presented, not always easy. Then decide the treatment, can be simply rehab, open surgery or arthroscopic surgery. So in case of recurrence, some basic guidelines, open, no discussion if you have a relevant bony lesion, if you have a poor capsule or if you have a subscap failure. Never forget about the subscap. It plays a major role in, in some patient. Arthroscopy, when you have good capsule in bone integrity, that is a non-common condition. When you have a symptomatic subluxation, you may go for open when you had an incorrect diagnosis or you have an hardware problem, as I mentioned in the previous presentation. Or arthroscopy, when you have a diagnostic treatment of mispathology or a correction of an inadequate repair. Limited range of motion, open subscap shortening, severe capsular shortening or hardware problem. Arthroscopy, you can make a nice lysis of the intraarticular and subacromial adhesions and uh, restore the range of motion with an oriented capsule release. Then I did a paper almost 10 years ago, nine years ago, to evaluate in a personal court if arthroscopic revision of recurrent instability after arthroscopic stabilization is a reasonable option. These are the patient, not many of course, but with a reasonable follow-up and these are the results. You see that I had a recurrence rate in 36% of the cases. So you can draw your conclusion. It is not something that you can rely on very much. Then I did another study, same, same period. And I wanted to see if there is a role of arthroscopy in the revision of the failed Latarge procedure. And then I analyzed some cases that I faced not only for this location, but some, not many, but some later years, they are a little painful, discomfort of the patient. They do not redislocate, so theoretically, you have good results. But if you speak with the patient, they have discomfort. And so analy I analyze these cases. These are 17 uh, subjects with 18 shoulders. Again, the follow-up is acceptable again in order to evaluate this. These are the data that I analyzed in this, in this study, age of the first, blah, 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 blah. You can read it easily, but in, 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 in the interest of time, I'm not spending too much into it because at the end, uh, there is, uh, we, we evaluated the, our outcome according to the Royal score that were excellent in uh, two thirds of the cases with a mean value than 75. Two thirds can be good or bad depending, depending the way you want to see it. But after arthroscopic revision, we had uh, another surgery in 16.7% of the cases. So with this return to sport activity, two-thirds, 
dislocation for mild trauma 6% and subluxation or sprains 11%. So overall, failure of this revision to me was 16.7. And let's go to the literature about this because very few people, they bring bad, bad results, but I like to analyze my bad results much better than the good ones. Everybody wants to show the muscles, but we need to show what, what we, we can improve our results. And you see here, we have Sung Ho Kim reporting uh, after a previous open end arthroscopic in bunker repair, arthroscopic revision 21% of recurrence. This is another paper with a previous open end arthroscopic in bunker repair 27. Then again, open end arthroscopic 27. This is Barnes, previous arthroscopic bunker, 6% only of recurrence. Pascal 16 and myself 16.7. So close to Pascal, maybe because we are very close also in terms of geography. So as a conclusion, as a conclusion, uh, you may eventually use even the scope to revise some specific condition of, of the, of the latter G. Uh, that you can make some correction, but of course not the major instability. And I show you basically before ending the presentation this little thing. This gentleman boy was subluxating and I simply covered my screws I recreated. What is interesting is that you find some capsule even after a latrage, one year after or two years after, you find some soft tissue and I covered that. And the patient was happy uh, without making any major issue. But of course it is quite challenging. So there is a room, yes, but in very much selected cases. Revision of failed arthroscopic repair by scope means that you are facing 36% of, of uh, recurrence. I don't know if you want to accept that. Or if you have a painful or little uh, subluxating or symptomatic lethargy, maybe there is some role for arthroscopy before going to major surgery. Thank you very much again, and I'm enjoying the, the meeting very much. I think now we have a, a time for discussion for the first paper by Dr. Uh, uh, Castani uh, uh, about screw types and bone graft. Okay, so can I ask? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mohammed. Yeah. Uh, well, the question is, did you always, do you always use two screws? Answer is no. Uh, and I explain you. Because never and always are meaningless words in my, my mind. Uh, I operate a lot of people and crazy enough sometimes I have such a small coracoid. The coracoid is not always the same. Sometimes you have a big one, you have a big piece of bone, some other case, and especially I notice in some professional soccer player, you know, the big guys with muscles and so on, black coming from uh, Africa or so, small little tiny coracoid. So in this case, the risk is to break the, the bone graft, so I use one screw only. The problem also that when you enter, you may find the coracoid is fractured. Yes. Yes. At, at this time, uh, your opinion to use one screw, but if you don't find any bone to fix it. Uh, any bone? Uh, what? To hold the screw. What uh, will, was your solution? Uh, you mean after a breakage of, of the... No. No. Again, when you the enter question. inside, you find very tiny bone yeah. fragments. Yeah. Very hardly to be fixed with even one screw. Mm -hmm. Well, it never happened to me to have a too small, such a small coracoid in order not to be able to put one screw at least. So I cannot give you an answer. Uh, I did some little revisions in some cases that I use also some arthroscopic anchors to stabilize it. This is, but it happened once or twice in my life. But crazy enough, I have at least three or four cases with a breakage of the, of the bone graft and you see a little piece of the graft that is floating behind the subs cap like the original alpha technique and they are honestly perfectly stable I don't know why I don't know why but the mechanism of that uh, that procedure is multiple not only grafting the bone there is something you else. use washers also for the screws um, no I started at the beginning I completely removed this and now the, the, the screws that I use have a little included but it is not floating it is included uh, in, in the system so they 
they cannot go around just in case because I, I like the less metal I can in that area. Okay. So I know that there is a technique to fix the craft with a suture yeah, yeah. from posterior to anterior. What, what's your opinion and Dr. Tinino about that? Well, I, I, I use, you, you can use sutures, but you really also need to lock it. So this is why I said I'm using, uh, it happened to me to use some arthroscopic anchors and fix it and then lock it. Yeah, I don't have experience with using the sutures for that. So I remember also some cases, uh, our colleagues, when they are preparing the crocoid for uh, putting it, they crack the graft. Graft is uh, smashed. So I advise them to just wrap it with uh, ethopond or uh, whatever fiber wire and transosseous like uh, Greg Morgan, and they, they, find, they go on and... Uh, yeah. Instead, Instead of transosseous, you can yeah. use anchors, and, and yeah. if at the end it is the same stuff. A any other question for the first lecture? For Dr. Tenino about uh, 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 lethargy or liberal repair. No, Walid? No question? Yeah, Dr. Gaman. I don't know that there is a study. Uh, you're talking about remplissage versus lethargy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Do you have experience with that, Alex? Uh, I, I, there are no direct comparison, uh, but remplissage is a little bit, at least in Europe, declining somehow because some pain is described, you know, for the posterior. It is a more than a. It is a capsule of myodesis, including the the muscle instead of. Uh, simply the, um, the capsule and so on and so on. Yes. So okay. it's slightly, slightly declining. Somehow. Yeah, but, but you, you know what raised this subject is the, uh, the new idea of Di Giacomo from Italy also about if you have uh, an off track with less than 20% of glenoid bone loss as a bipolar, then this, these cases, if you do just liberal repair, it yeah. will fail. So uh, adding remplissage will be benefit. And on the other hand, with this group, other surgeons said, no, these are candidates for lethargy. Yeah. So I think till now there is no uh, published uh, studies about uh, this, uh, comparing both these techniques. Huh? Yeah, but you know, there are these gray zones where, uh, honestly, we don't have an answer that is, this is right, this is wrong. It is a gray zone, and again, we started 25%, then 20, now 15 and then we never speak about the capsule, for instance, because after you have erosion, but also histological changes in the capsule and the ligament after many episodes. So you're going to repair not an healthy tissue when you make your capsulography, you are repairing a fibrous tissue that is not strong enough, as I demonstrated, 36% uh, of failure. So there are many other issues than just the biomechanics. It is just an important aspect, of course, but not the only one. Dr. Walid. I have a question, please. You are more in favor with the uh, uh, banker repair or arthroscopic repair, even there is a uh, bone fragment and we incorporate in the repair. You yes. Sa you so, said this. Yeah. So what is the fate of this bone in the future after healing? <coughs> if it will be consolidated with the same uh, width of the glenoid, so we will have the same glenoid track, or it will be just a, a reattachment of the capsular liberal uh, structure, but we have some deficiency in the glenoid uh, in the future. Well, I think most of it, uh, I think the, the bone fragment, if you get CAT scans, you can see that it incorporates, not all of them, because I think some of them, probably the bone is not as good anymore. Uh, but I, I think it provides at least some reconstitution of the glenoid. And I don't think you should take it out. You should at least try to incorporate. If you find it, mobilize it, lift it up and then incorporate it into your repair. I do think that will help reconstitute some of your bone loss. Actually, there is a study by Sugaya about the question of Walid that incorporation of the bone fragment on the repair and you're doing CT after that, it grows and, uh, and heals and there is remodeling of this fragment later. Yeah, I think it was published this year, I yes. think, or last year. My, my question to you, 
how how much do you can do a lethargy without bond effect? How how many cases you can do a lethargy without bond effect? If you have zero bond effect, when you do lethargy? Never. <laughs> well, zero zero bond effect to me is first episode or so. So it is not a much, of course, because when you have several episodes, you have erosion and you have a poorer capsule. So I'm, because earlier this morning, many, many speakers were saying, well, arthroscopy is a nightmare. And I reported my results, but now let's not go on the other side, because it is difficult to do this and this and this. So I, if I have first episode, I try to operate with no bony fragments. Uh, immediately, and I honestly say that the outcome is good. They have a couple of those, and no bone defect. I still stay on arthroscopy when they become recurrent with recurrent subluxation because erosion may happen even with subluxation. I'm much more cautious. Okay. Yeah, because so I, I, I read a paper this year about primary lethargy after first time dislocation is primary first. lethargy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is what. Uh, it, Dr. Tonino said, if you go to France, in, I have seen cases like this. 14 years old boy, I've seen it. Uh, first episode, lethargy. Okay. But this is not me. So if it is many times, but just trim attrition and no capsule, what you do, Dr. Tonino? Capsule is very bad and liver is very bad. Well, then ob obviously, if you don't have good anatomy there, then. Um, then an art, some sort of other procedure, and a lethargy is appropriate for those kind of things. Uh, you need to have, I think Dr. Uh, um, Alex Castagna talked about, you need to have good anatomy. You can't repair, you know, it's kind of like we talked about yesterday, the ACL. If you do a repair of the ACL, but the tissue is not so good, it's probably not going to re uh, result very, very good result. Okay. For both of you, how often you do lethargy with rim blessage? Say it again. How often you do rim blessage with lethargy? Could you combine? Um, Alex, I don't know what your experience is with it. I mean, I think I, I agree. I must say never. Yeah, but. <laughs> so, I never. must I say also that I do uh, lethargy open. I, I tried arthroscopic, but I still do it open because I don't see personally, ben this is a personal opinion, any benefit for the patient. Cowboy doctor, uh, doctor uh, uh, from Texas. Uh, some, uh, some also Steve Burkhardt, yeah, he's doing it open up till now. And he's a uh, father of. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you told us about subscapularis you should look at. So if you have the subscapularis is torn, and there is an EMG study that the nerve is, have been done. So what is your preferred muscle transfer? Latissimus or back up? Yeah, well, traditionally, because latissimus is coming back more recently, so I cannot report you many cases that we did. So traditionally, we did the pec. The pec, the pec above, above the conjoint tendon. But now latissimus makes more, more sense, biomechanically speaking. So we are moving into it. That is not that difficult thing. And, um, but these are very uncommon conditions. But anyways, maybe latissimus is becoming the option in the near future. But just a feeling. If you have hill sex and no loss from the glenoid side, did you recommend lethargy or uh, arthroscopic? If I have hill sex, hill sex lesion, head on the head side, hill sex, and no bone loss from the glenoid, would you like to do lethargy or uh, arthroscopy? No. I mean. Um, hill sex lesion with a shoulder dislocation is very frequent, mm -hmm. so it really doesn't change unless it's a big, big lesion. That maybe, but if I don't have any. What's meant by big lesion? How how much? You can't really measure it, so you have to, you can look at it. But in general, I expect the hill sex lesion with a shoulder dislocation. It's not an unexpected finding. So if I don't have bone loss and a glenoid, I'm not going to do a procedure. Uh, lethargy for something that doesn't involve the glenoid, um, the hill sex lesion is a defect on the humeral head. I'm looking for a defect on the glenoid. That's where I think the lethargy would be helpful. But I increase the arc of the glenoid and so I combat for hill sex lesion. Exactly. When I do uh, lethargy, the arc is increasing. 
and so the glenoid arc is increasing and so I will, uh, uh, the zyl sac lesion will not affect uh, uh, the, the instability. Hmm? Um, I, I change it, I put it on the track. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> that's a whole different discussion with uh, Dr. Itoy here talking about glenoid track. Um, but I think what he's talking about, we're talking about is the letterge is a bone substitute for bone loss on the glenoid. And uh, to do a, a letterge for a hill sex lesion to me doesn't make sense. So, so we make it vice versa. When to do bone graft for the humeral head, yeah. both of you. Exactly, this was the point, because depending how severe it is, because the answer can be, in the very bad cases, bone grafting. Yeah, I think we tried reemplissage just to fill it in, but I am not too convinced that it's great. Yeah. Uh, I did it in the bad cases, I like bone Caesar graft cases, or or graft with design. bony deficiency in the humerus, with Caesar, I grafted. But not every day. I mean, once every other year. I know there is a lot of question, but Dr. Raed, uh, oh, last one, Dr. Mustafa Rafat. Sorry. I have two questions to Dr. Cassandra. Um, the first one about the uh, uh, unsatisfactory results after the letter G. Uh, how you classify the, this say, unsatisfactory results, uh, whether biceps, whether instability, and the arthroscopic management you, do, you, you did. Uh, how was the... Uh, yeah, how, how, well, what you mean the, the series that I, I published? You, you mean those? These yeah. were symptomatic, subluxating, and with discomfort never re-dislocating, but still significantly symptomatic with discomfort for the patient. Then the scope is the greatest tool you can have just to understand because the noise that is created with imaging due to the metallic the screws is confusing you. you uh, I mean, imaging is not helping that much unless you have a clear breakage of, uh, unless you have something that is massive, uh, it's hard to understand. So scoping the patient is helping you very much. And I showed you one of these few cases that I did. Yes. And quite often I found this labral, uh, well, not labral because the labrum is not there, but you know, you can recover, you protect this, you can create some more soft tissue barrier and creating this. And also the biceps was involved in quite a few cases. Yes. Have I know that uh, Dr. Bessem want to comment. Have you did, have you did uh, tenodesis okay. for this? Okay, cases? so, okay. Okay. Have you did tenodesis for these cases in case of biceps? Okay. Have you did uh, biceps tenodesis for these cases? I believe so. I believe so. I, I must go by memory. It was yeah. 10 years ago, but I think so. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the second question, please. I, I want to uh, re uh, ask about uh, what Muhammad Abu Noor said uh, about uh, if you have a first time dislocator and the letter G might be an option for uh, either score, uh, for a high score on the ISIS score? Uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure that this, this is a good point because uh, if it is a first episode in a young boy, I'm not thinking all, only at the recurrence rate if it is acceptable, other than a possible revision because when you're a young boy, you may destroy everything, including a latarge. And revising a latarge is a headache both for the patient and the surgeons so I, i'm not prone to that i accept a two or three percent higher recurrence rate but with the easy revisability this is my opinion again not not a low thank you uh, this is a wonderful session thanks for the speaker and thanks for the audience for the talk and dr rider now uh, saying to me uh, we finish for lunch is it right Okay. Okay.